All right, are we ready for this? Uh, so um, we'll have, you know, scheduled like three, three and a half hours. Um, it's, three, it's two parts, right, two parts. Um, first part, I'll give a sort of a presentation with PowerPoints, uh, really uh, introducing to you some of the big genomic resources out there. And the second part is more of a hands-on um, uh, demonstration of the Washington University uh, epigenome browser, the WashU epigenome browser, right? Uh, so at the end of the day, really what I wanted to convey is a very simple message that, in, that is, we're, we're in an era of big data, big genomic data, right? How do we deal with it, right? So we developed one tool, uh, which is this epigenome browser to facilitate uh, research, uh, facilitate my own research, uh, but at the same time, we prov pr uh, provide this uh, for the, to the large community, and hopefully you'll find that too uh, useful. So if anything, I want you to take home with you uh, after the three and a half hours um, is that, you know, you, 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 you know there is that too, and then maybe that's going to be useful for your own uh, research. Maybe you'll see how people are struggling and then dealing with uh, the so-called uh, big data, okay? So I'm going to explain, you know, this image a little bit later, but this is really the most recent uh, development of the, our browser. I'm sort of jumping way ahead of myself and say, we're making our WashU epigenome browser a video game. <laughs> so the goal is we're going to turn this research tool into a video game so, you know, uh, people will enjoy doing research uh, uh, you know, well, play, right? So, and, you know, think about the, the educational impact once we really make it a, a video game, you know, we can send to high schools and undergraduates and they don't have to talk to their parents for more screen time anymore, right? So that's going to help them hopefully uh, studying the genome. So this is sort of a making the genome browser, these are genomic data, virtual reality possible. So we're going to get there in about three hours. But really, I'm, I'm from St. Louis. St. Louis is right in the middle of the country far away from oceans and mountains actually, but we have an arch. We have this beautiful arch, which is a monument for the uh, uh, Wild West exploration. And my lab uh, developed the WashU epigenome browser and we borrowed the arch and we use it as a, we call this a, 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 a gateway to the human epigenome. And then the, the, the river flowing under uh, the arch are the, uh, the genomic data that we're seeing today, okay? So, uh, so what we're we doing now, right? So we're in a good time. You know, this is the post-genome era, and you know we're all enjoying uh, power of uh, genomics. Uh, there are so many uh, large consortiums developed. Uh, even small labs, like my own lab, is able to generate a huge amount of genomics data now. You know, with sequencing technology and everything. So we're really in a time. Uh, you know, to enjoy the power of genomics and to really witness this data flood in the post-genome era, right? So, you know, the data is really coming overwhelming, right? you know, so that's, that's, that's sort of the, the it's, it's a power, it's a reality, but it's also a daunting uh, challenge. So this is what we want to do with this power of flood, right? Data flood. At least this is what we pretend to do with the data. You know, we all want to do this. I don't know how many people can actually do that. And this is sort of a, you know, the reality. If we don't know the power, you know, what's really in the power of genomics, uh, you know, the data actually come back from behind and then bite you there, right? So this is sort of the, the, the uh, how, how we think about, uh, you know, the power of uh, genomics and then the, 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 the ability to understand this power. Uh, in fact, because of the amount of the data, you know, you probably hear people say, if you look hard enough, you're going to find all sorts of patterns that you want to see, right? And that's typical in genomics. That's something that we need to be very aware of um, before we jump into genome, uh, genomic data analysis. So today I'm going to introduce you a few consortiums uh, that I've had the privilege to be part of, uh, really helped me launch my career, really helped me understand what big data means in the context of biology, in the context of genomics. And I'm a biologist, uh, so I'm, I, I'll basically uh, you know, briefly introduce a few consortiums for you. Um, 
Uh, I'll start with roadmap epigenomics project. I'll tell you a little bit about ENCODE. I hope many people actually know some of the, uh, uh, the consortium. Uh, 40N is a relatively new consortium that Jin and myself are part of. Uh, I'm also running a data center for uh, an environmental epigenomics project. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of this just to convey the, uh, the, the point that, you know, people are taking advantage of genomic uh, the, uh, the power of genomics, right? Um, what we want to do, I'll come back to this point, is to turn this big, big, big bio data information flood into a big bio data information flow, right? So I'm a very simple person, so I really see three things in this process. Uh, we're going to produce the data, we're going to process data, and we're going to consume the data. Again, you know, my personal uh, uh, sort of a development history had made myself being part of all three. So we generate data, we package the data, and we ourselves are data consumers, right? So I'm going to touch on all three, but really focusing on the mid layer here. I think this is the purpose of today's workshop. That is, you know, you know, there are a lot of data out there. How do we package the data so that you can consume the data better? Right? So that's the uh, the idea. So the Wash Your Epigenome Browser is really created to interfacing this processing data and consuming uh, data. So that's that's where that uh, comes in. Okay. So a little bit of history. Uh, this is really the reason that we have our Epigenome Browser today. The two reasons. This is one of them. So the Roadmap Epigenome Project was launched in 2008, 2009 ish. Uh, it was one of the post genome project. As we know, you know, the Human Genome Project is probably one of the first so-called big data project, right? So we were able to sequence our genome, and we have a reference genome, and that really transformed how biomedical sciences is done, right? Because we have that human genome uh, reference. That reference was completed for the first time back in 2001, until today, it's not, still not completed, right? So, so, so we're, there's a community effort in in um, you know, finishing and uh, making that genome assembly better. But that really provided the foundation for modern genomics, modern biomedical uh, sciences. In fact, the uh, NIH is launching yet another human genome reference project. Uh, the goal is to uh, build the next generation human reference that is no longer one strain of letter, right? So the new reference will incorporate a lot more genetic variations, structural variations, um, and it's going to be presented in uh, formats, including, you know, genome graph, not no longer a string of letter, but genome graph, that sort of thing, right? So, so in the next few years, uh, we'll, we will sequence another, you know, 350 complete human genome, with, which means going from, you know, telomere to telomere, uh, com, you know, com, to completion, right? So the current human genome uh, uh, reference is what, still only 90% complete, right? So there's still, it's very useful, it's, but, but it's not uh, complete. But after that human genome project, there are several um, sort of post genome projects um, so launched. Roadmap epigenomics is one of them. The idea is now that we have a human reference genome, we want a human reference epigenome. Right? So we want a functional map of our genome, not just the sequence, but the, the functional annotation of that sequence. So 2008, this project was well launched. Uh, it lasted all the way to, I think, 2015. That's when the project um, completed and then caught really a big success, right? So overall, the project, I think, cost like two to $300 million. It's a big project. Uh, one of the component is mapping centers, right? So there are lots of research activity, but also a mapping activity uh, with four mapping centers, U of Washington, UCSF, UC San Diego, and Broad Institute. Uh, Baylor was the data coordination center. So this is St. Louis. This is where I'm from, right? So I flew all the way here. Um, so we played sort of a two roles, right, in, in, this, in, in this consortium. So first, uh, just, you know, these are data production centers. We also generated some data. My lab works on DNA methylation, so we contributed a teeny tiny fraction of the DNA methylation data to the entire uh, map. Uh, but another role that we played was to develop this uh, use, uh, uh, WashU uh, epigenome browser. That's what I'm going to introduce uh, to you. At the time, 
uh, we were really given a challenge uh, to uh, provide a platform so that uh, you know, investigators can access thousands of genomics data. Right? So that's, that was the challenge. I'll tell you some of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, design based on those uh, uh, challenges. So this is the take home. This is the website, you know, so, so that's, you know, e e that's what we developed and then that's what I'm going to uh, uh, show you today. And hopefully this website uh, will be useful uh, for your own uh, research. So uh, the project lasted for six years. We generated uh, complete epigenome data sets across more than 100 tissue and cell types. Uh, the tissues span, you know, adult tissues and cells, fetal tissues, embryonic stem cells, iPI cells. Uh, the kind of epigenetic um, assays that we did include, you know, histone modification, DNA methylation, open chromatin, what have you. So this is a large uh, set of data. So all, in the end, we generated about, about 30,000 uh, genome-wide uh, data sets for, for, for this project, for this project, right? Uh, so, and that, you know, I, I, if you think about genome is linear, then the epigenome gives you the second dimension. It's the layer of information on top of uh, the genome and tells you the, you know, the, because, uh, uh, you, you know, think about the epigenome, it, it, it changes between different cell types, uh, changes during development. So this is really a, a multi-dimensional uh, data set, okay? Uh, 2015, we, you know, launched, we published, basically published a bunch of papers, a lot of data. And this is sort of a, one of the working group, uh, you know, picture. So that, that's me there. I was much younger than what I'm looking at now. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, this, this is sort of one of the uh, meeting. I think this is Boston, but, you know, we, we put this out there, okay? So we published lots of paper. The papers are collecting dust now. Um, what really ended up, you know, the, the real value is this so-called human reference epigenome. And this is a multi-dimensional data, and this is the data uh, that is hosted uh, by uh, the WashU epigenome browser, right? So this is what we hope uh, that's gonna be useful uh, for your own research. Okay, just, um, so that's the roadmap project. So we can see the ENCODE project uh, sort of a sister project of Roadmap, but it's really a uncle project, not the sister, but, you know, uncle-nephew kind of relationship. ENCODE had much longer history than Roadmap, right? Roadmap was like one phase, six years, that's it, okay? ENCODE has been going on for much longer. So ENCODE was launched, uh, I think, in 2004, 2003, 2004. The goal of ENCODE is to... Um, also functionally annotated the human genome, right? When we have the genome, we want to functionally annotate it. Uh, so it's a encyclopedia of DNA elements. So that's essentially what ENCO stands for. When it was just launched, the first round of, of activity, um, people actually decided to select 1% of the genome to do functional assays. And the most of the driving assays are things like a qPCR and, uh, you know, uh, you know, things like that. So, but, but focusing on, it's a genomic approach because you look at the entire genome, you look at 1%, but it's all over, over, all over the place that allows you to derive um, uh, rules uh, that you otherwise won't uh, be able to, to learn, right? But ENCODE has been evolving, uh, you know, very fast because again, technology uh, is booming. So ENCODE quickly moved into microarray-based uh, assays and quickly went from 1% of the genome to the entire genome and quickly moved into sequencing-based uh, assays. And then now uh, we're already in the fourth uh, uh, phase of ENCODE. So there will be ENCODE 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the, the consortium actually generated a huge amount of data for the, for the community. The goals are very simple. The goals are catalog all the functional elements Right? and make this resource available uh, to, the, to the community. And you can certainly access all the ENCODE data uh, through our browser, but also through a lot of other uh, resources. So the current phase, uh, like I mentioned, phase four ENCODE is made of uh, not only the uh, um, 
the, the, the uh, mapping center. So that's sort of what the old ENCODE was about, you know, creating that map. Uh, the, 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 uh, the unique uh, addition of this new phase is this functional characterization uh, center, right? So the idea is, you know, we need to, because of, again, technology, things like CRISPR has been now become more and more uh, ready, you can actually do large scale functional um, characterization, right? In other words, in the past, you want to do a, a chip seek and then, you know, find all the peaks. Now you can do a systematic, maybe CRISPR across the genome to, to, to assess a functional uh, uh, consequence on a phenotypic uh, readout, right? So, so they, you know, this center uh, is charged with the uh, 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 mission to, um, you know, really, you know, in a large scale characterize uh, elements defined by the mapping centers, right? So massive parallel reporter gene assay, massive parallel this and that, right? So that's, that's what, 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 what's sort of a new. So in this context, uh, so, so, and then we will also have like individual project computation analysis project, data coordination center, uh, data analysis center and things like that, right? So um, ENCODE continue to provide uh, lead in terms of genomic technology, a lot of the protocols people use for ChIP-seq, for example, was really developed, defined, quality assured by ENCODE community. Uh, there's, you know, all sorts of um, uh, assays are being performed, uh, DNA methylation, RNA-seq, uh, chromatin interaction. So, so, you know, spanning a, 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 a really every corner of, of genomics. Um, <clears throat> This is the uh, uh, this is the main uh, ENCODE uh, website. Um, uh, I should have that website somewhere. I should have the website. So it's really just en en um, um, you know this this is sort of the the main website for ENCODE um, consortium. If you go there, uh, you'll see uh, you know the different the spec uh, spectrum of projects, different sample types. A different type of assays, and you can uh, search and you can access uh, um, tools developed by the ENCODE community, including this. This is a specific, a special tool called uh, Screen, right? So you can, um, you know, access uh, ENCODE data uh, that way. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, um, you know, some other ways of accessing essentially the same data. Uh, this illustrates that the community is really taking advantage of ENCODE. Uh, you know, this is the number of publications. This is not publications from ENCODE labs. These are publications from the community uh, using ENCODE data uh, is scaling uh, up, you know, dramatically. So, you know, hopefully, you know, you will use this data to, to enhance your own uh, research. Uh, just a quick announcement, ENCODE is also organizing a lot of uh, tutorials and workshops. Uh, there is an upcoming users meeting uh, this summer in Seattle. Uh, three days, uh, so there will be a lot of uh, sort of data jamboree, you know, that sort of a, a event uh, happening there, right? So it's not yet advertised. We just set a date. We're working on a schedule, uh, but you know, once you know, uh, once the, the uh, we, we expect that the announcement will come out very uh, soon. So that's the Encode Consortium. It's a large consortium. It's lots of effort uh, there. And I think that's me right there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. For the end, right? So I hope people here are not uh, are, are familiar with for the end because uh, Jin's part of it. Um, you know, this is uh, another post genome project. This is really post uh, roadmap epigenomics, right? So if you think about again, genome is linear one dimension. Epigenome, you get two dimensions now, right? You add another di dimension, all the, you know, epigenetic marks, you know, cross tissues and cells. Um, this uh, project really uh, aims to create the three-dimensional map, right? Not a 2D map anymore, but three-dimensional map of the nuclei of the, our genome, of our genome. And the fourth dimension is time or development. Right? Therefore, we have this 4D uh, uh, pro uh, program. The idea is really now go into you know, the nuclei and then figure out the, the 3D structure of the nuclei and how that influence, uh, uh, you know, uh, gene activities. And the 
uh, 4D uh, nucleum project has been going on for three and a half years now. Uh, these are the major component. Uh, so there's a organization hub hosted by Dr. Uh, Sheng Zhong at UC San Diego. There's a bunch of mapping centers doing both genomic mapping as well as imaging. Um, there's a, couple, a few, uh, several tool developments. So this, these are specific uh, technology development efforts uh, and also a data coordination uh, 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 center effort. So there are two data coordination centers. Uh, one is at Harvard and the other is at uh, Washington uh, University. Uh, so Peter Bark is doing all the heavy lifting because he's responsible for integrating, you know, getting the data, processing data, integrating the data, uh, all, most of the upstream uh, work. Uh, so our uh, uh, mission is to present this data to the, to the community through our uh, genome browser. Okay, uh, so these are the uh, promises uh, our consortium is making uh, to the field. Uh, we're really de de delivering biological data, knowledge, as well as technology, tools, standards. Uh, but in the end, you know, we're going to create a map, right? So we're going to use that map for a lot of our own research. Uh, but we're, the, the real goal is to make that map and present that map to the, to the uh, large scientific uh, community. And this is really a, a, a you know, multidisciplinary synergistic uh, effort. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, leader uh, PI, Job Decker, uh, published a perspective um, you know, on this project um, a couple of, almost two years ago now. So this is the main web website. This is the website hosted, maintained by uh, Dr. Sheng Zhong at UC San Diego. Uh, if you go to uh, this website, you'll see uh, you, you'll be able to access all the resources, including protocols. You're going to um, access uh, 40 in publications, but also you can launch the data portal, right? So there's a link here uh, that you can launch, and that goes to the data portal developed and hosted by Peter Park at Harvard University, uh, where you can actually see you know, the available uh, 4DN data. So this is an example. If you click on the resources from that website, uh, you're going to see uh, you know, protocol cell lines and all the software. And then you further down, you, you're going to uh, be able to access this. I want to say you know, the, you know, the, the, this is really an important consortium uh, goal, that is to disseminate the uh, technologies, right? So I feel, you know, I'm actually really fortunate to be working in the context of consortium because, you know, I, I, I found that I can get access, I, uh, access where I can access the, uh, the uh, you know, new technologies pretty easily. Like, for example, my lab has never done high C experiments before in the past. I'm not, you know, that's not part of my background. But, you know, because we're part of this consortium, I, you know, we have access to this technology. So it, it took us just a few months to adopt the, the high c protocol. And then we, we can generate beautiful high c data. I showed some data like, you know, to, earlier today. So, so, you know, um, uh, so, so, you know, the consortium is very open. Uh, so, you know, go to, you go there, you'll find a protocol, you'll find people who develop the protocol, you can talk to them, get all the, you know, nitty gritty uh, details, uh, uh, nuances. Um, so so the, the really one of the important goal, uh, for, goals for, for this consortium, for all this consortium is to disseminate technology and tools in addition to the data, okay? So speaking of data, this is all the data that we have now as of maybe a couple of, you know, maybe a month ago. So a lot of data already accumulated for, for uh, 40N, okay? I'm, I mean, the resolution of this is really a little bit unfortunate. I, I think it's going to influence the, the, the hands-on part, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, so um, these are the 40N uh, software. So, um, you know, we actually created uh, multiple uh, ways for people to access data, this data. Worship browser is one of them, so I'm listed uh, here, right? So that's the 40N project. Look, this is the 14 consortium. It's even bigger than ENCODE. You know, if you ask me, this consortium is kind of too big. <laughs> uh, <guess>, yes, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> All right. Okay, so 
um, just very quickly, uh, there is an international consortium. So it turns out this is uh, when we had, when the US launched the roadmap epigenomics project, it had a global in, impact, right? So uh, other countries are, uh, you know, you're, uh, are, are putting together their own effort for, uh, you know, creating this uh, reference epigenome. And we actually formed this alliance uh, that's called International Human Epigenome uh, consortium with countries, you know, uh, from European, you know, Germany and Spain and can and, and also, you know, uh, the, uh, like Canada, Japan, Korea. So lots of countries are, are, are part of this consortium. I think the most recent addition is Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is part of this consortium as well. Um, they also generated a, a lot of uh, data. I mean, that two years ago, I think they published a, a whole bunch of papers uh, in cell. Uh, so they have this portal, they developed this portal uh, for accessing their data. So feel free to go there and you'll know, see thousands of, you know, epigenomic data sets uh, there. Um, these are the members of the consortium. Uh, you know, Roadmap is actually the, one of the first uh, member. Uh, so European has this blueprint project, Canada has this project, you know, Genome Canada, and uh, this is the epigenome Hong Kong. Uh, so ENCODE and 40N are now part of this IHAC uh, community. So that's sort of a, a big um, alliance. So, um, you know, we also, I'll, 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 sh I'll show you, you know, we, we also made an effort to make sure that through the Washio Epigenome Browser, you can access IHAC uh, data, okay? Ah, so this is the IHAC data portal. Uh, you know, the type of, uh, you know, assays the, the, uh, uh, that's hosted there. And this is, this is sort of a, a loose organization, but it's, it's ongoing. So finally, uh, I'm going to introduce a less well-known consortium. Uh, so this is uh, called Target. Uh, this is much smaller than ENCODE or 40N. Um, this is also a derivative from the Roadmap Epigenome Project. So Roadmap Project was funded by uh, the Common Fund, uh, NIH Common Fund, for, for, for those who actually sort of follow this type of uh, 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 things. Uh, so, so the idea is, you know, you fund this one project, right, make an impact, and then you hope that different uh, institutes uh, that are more specific to, you know, a, a organ or disease, you know, heart and lung or cancer, they're going to pick up and then do their own version, right? So this is ex exactly what happened here. So the uh, the... NIEHS, the Environmental uh, Health Institute, actually picked it up and I thought, okay, you know, roadmap generated all this impact and uh, technology that we can use. Uh, so we're going to do our own roadmap project, but on exposure. So that's for in environmental uh, uh, impact. So the idea is, um, you know, we want to understand environmental impact on human health, um, but through the epigenome, right? So environment they'll change your genome, but a little bit, but the, the major impact is through, probably through the epigenome, right? So uh, there are two overarching goals for this consortium. First, you know, for a given environmental exposure, for example, you know, heavy metals, some sort of a chemicals or, or, or pollution, right? These are the environmental exposures. You know, what are the target tissue or cells uh, in the body, right? So does it influence blood? Does it influence brain neurons, right? So that's the first question this consortium hopes to address. The second consortium uh, question is, let's say we know the target tissue, say the target tissue is the brain, right? So heavy metal influenced the brain, but you can't really scoop out your brain and measure all the time, right? So you want a surrogate tissue. So the idea is, can we find, for a given exposure, for a given target tissue, can we find a surrogate tissue by measuring, by, by measuring which we're going to learn what's happening in the target tissue, right? So that's the sort of the goal of the consortium. Uh, the approach we take is big old genomics, right? So we use epigenomics approach. We profile, so, in, so this is multi-phases. This phase is based on mouse model, right? Basically we profile, you know, mice on different exposure paradigm and measure their epigenome and try to uh, you know, understand the, 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 you know, the, the 
tissue of target and then tissue of, you know, the surrogate tissue. So, so this is also a consortium. Um, again, it's small, it has like six data production centers. We are the data coordination center. Uh, so we're integrating all this um, uh, 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 data and studies um, to, to, you know, um, sort of understand environmental exposure. Okay, so what I've, you know, uh, what I just did is just a very brief introduction of a few consortiums. There are more. There are TCGA. You, you all know TCGA, right? the Cancer Genome Atlas. There are many other consortiums. The one thing in common is we all hope that we can take advantage of genomics, the power of genomics, to better understand biology. And the common problem we face is how to deal with uh, bio data, big bio data, right? Again, I'm bringing back this slide just to, to show the challenges that we face, right? So uh, we need to understand the problems in producing the data, in processing data, and in, in the end uh, to, uh, in consuming uh, this genomic data. And our goal is to uh, create the tools and the logic and the concept uh, that allow us to turn this big information flood into a flow, okay? So the solution that I'm presenting, well, one of the, uh, one thing that we did is this wash your epigenome browser. So I'm gonna very briefly go over uh, the history. Right? So what is a genome browser? Well, you know, you, you can't talk about genome browser without talking about the UCSC genome browser. In fact, this is where I uh, learned uh, you know, everything I learned, I know about genome browser, I learned, I learned uh, from UCIC when I was a, a postdoc fellow. So, you know, genome browser was created to, as a web-based display for um, uh, the early draft of human genome, right? So it's really, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's a very simple concept. You use a line to represent the genome, right? And then you use the genomic coordinates. Once you have this coordinate, you can align your annotation uh, to that genome. And that's exactly what, uh, you know, the typical genome browser uh, is, uh, is designed, right? So you have the genome browser, you have the linear genome, and you start to align annotations like the genes and conservation and function and variation. You can align this to, to, to this. So it's very, very intuitive. I think um, the reason that UCIC genome browser, so early days there are many more genome browsers, but UCIC genome browser, uh, also ensemble browser was the few ones that sort of survived. Right? The reason I think UCIC browser was, uh, you know, the, the best it was really because the developer, you know, Jim Kent, he, he he's just amazing. He, he, um, uh, he actually, you know, came from computer video gaming uh, industry, so he, you know, probably made enough money, so he's tired of that. So he decided to go through grad school, and then he uh, um, he first built a viewer for EST sequences for the elegance, and that turned into this genome browser, right? So he actually cares a lot about user interface, you know, how user experience. For example, you know, how how much response time, you know, a user will just be get tired and no longer use your tool, right? So he, he's actually very sensitive to that. So his browser is like, you know, the design is very simple and straightforward. So, so but, you know, we use this to, to illustrate the, the, the concept of genome browser. But there's limitation, right? So we know we're making, you know, this linear assumption of the genome. Now we know we have this dimension, you know, all the different type of data, all the different type of samples that, you know, the data is already a multi-dimensional uh, data set, right? So how do, you, how do you look at this data on a genome browser? That's that, you know, if you have a 10 data set, it's easy to think about. What if you have a thousand? And that's the number that we're dealing with. More importantly that, it, you know, we know the genome is not just linear. I mean, there's structures, right? So that's actually, the entire consortium is born to study that uh, structure. We all know that sometimes, you know, only when you look and look under those, those, those structures, you start to see, you know, beautiful things. And then, so, so we, need, we need to have ways to, to, you know, represent our data in a nonlinear fashion, right? So these are the sort of the challenges. So um, we were given these challenges back, you know, a few years ago, we were sort of hot with 
uh, roadmap epigenomics data uh, project. So I'm gonna just quickly go over this part of the history. So we wanted to create mechanisms for users to access roadmap data, right? So this is sort of the current number. So we build a hub, right? So what should build this data hub? You know, we didn't plan this, but it ended up uh, becoming um, a, a really, you know, you know, very, very elaborated uh, hub. So just a few, uh, you know, uh, numbers, you know, for the roadmap, I have like a lot of tracks. For ENCODE, we have a lot of tracks. For IHAC, we have a lot of tracks. We also have TCG and then some other stuff. So, so overall, our browser is now hosting close to 200,000 uh, data sets, uh, genomic data sets there, right? Uh, so that actually creates some opportunities to do some really data-driven uh, sciences, which we haven't really got a time <laughs> to, to do. But early days, um, we actually created a UCSC browser mirror for people to access roadmap data. We also created this concept. I mean, this is actually an important piece of history, this remote data hub concept. So UCSC browser in the past, you, is, you know, it's, um, if you upload say 50 data sets, you're gonna crash it, right? The reason is, uh, you know, browser is behind, you know, behind the browser is a database, right? So, the browser will do a database query, you know, get the data and then make the view and then present, right? So that's the classic uh, way of looking at uh, a genomic data on a genome browser. But if you put like a hundred genomic data sets into the database, your database just cannot handle it, right? So, so we actually um, designed together with uh, UCIC this remote data hub concept such that the data and browser are separated, right? So the data can be anywhere, right? the browser actually access state this data remotely, right? And then it will create that view for you. Uh, so your data can be, you know, your this three track can be in, in, in Boston, the other three can be in San Francisco and you can put them together. So, so this is sort of a, uh, a, a, an important innovation that quickly um, adopted by essentially all the modern, modern genome browsers. And then, we invented this Washio browser uh, as a sort of a net generation browser for uh, viewing uh, all this data. Right? And we actually um, built a lot of community outreach activities and workshops and like the one that we're hosting uh, right now. Okay. So a laundry list of our browser, right? So just very brief uh, description and then we're gonna go into the uh, demo. Okay, the, the hands-on part. So we say, we, 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 we're pretty proud of this tool. Uh, we think about us as, you know, building the innovations for uh, exploring genomic data. So we do uh, hope that this is a, a provide a, a, a community resource for this multidimensional data. So we have to go in and do a lot of engineering so that you can indeed browse hundreds of data set in one view. Right, so you can, you, you know, the mechanism is in place so that you can, you can really put, you know, hundreds or a thousand data sets in one view. You can look at the, your data, you know, in this typical Wego tracks, or you can compress them into heat maps that allows you to see, uh, to observe patterns. A few other innovations, right? So we created this metadata map, right? Because, you know, when, when you look at multiple data sets, you don't remember what they are anymore. Each data set comes with rich metadata, okay? You know, age, gender, response to chemo, you know, all this metadata information are crucial or instrumental for interp interpretation of genomic data. But how do you see that data? How do you see that, uh, that metadata? So the, the invention is very simple. We put a metadata map alongside with the genomic map. Right, so genomic map is on the left and the metadata is on the, uh, on the right. And then your metadata, you know, is really, uh, any metadata you, you can convert into a number and you can convert that into a color, right? So, and then or gradient of color. And you can actually sort on your metadata, group your samples based on metadata, you know, sort on metadata value and compare between different uh, uh, metadata, right? So that, you know, we're gonna, demo a little bit there uh, in a few minutes. 
So, so that's a you know, simple uh, invention. Another one is, as we know, genome is linear, right? So everything is aligned to the genome. And we actually broke that, right? We decided, well, what if you want to look at 20 promoters, of 20 of your favorite promoters, right? So in the past, what you have to do is you open 20 windows on the UCS genome browser, for example, right? 20 gene promoters, you know, you have 20 windows, okay? So what we, you know, did, did, this, you know did, decide to do is to allow you to look at multiple regions in one view. So you can actually move different parts of the genome, right? And then put them in an order, an orientation of your choice. So you can look at your 20 promoters in one view, right? So that's really just simply, you know, break the assumption that genome is linear. It's still a coordinate system, but you can move things around, right? Uh, and then when you have that ability, you can look at your favorite genes or you can look at your favorite pathways, right? Uh, you can even look at your data based on rearranged cancer genome, right? So that's a simple concept, but it's actually very, very useful. And indeed, that concept came from our own research. Um, you know, my, my, my actual science is transposable element. Right? I work on repetitive element in, in the genome. Uh, there are different families of transposable element. So I really wanted to, to have a way to look at, you know, let's say 20 copies of the same transposable element, you know, side by side. And it's just impossible on any other genome browser. So we created that function. And turns out that same concept can be used for other uh, purposes. Um, and then we also um, have, uh, I mentioned that the out, outreach uh, activities. So we're putting a lot of effort into uh, software engineering, right? So we really want to create a, sort of a, you know, a Google map or, or microscope for the human genome. Uh, so you can, you know, you have all sorts of uh, options in looking at your data. You can zoom and pan and drag and drop. Uh, you have, a, you know, as much freedom as you can imagine in configuring uh, your data. I, you know, I love color, so you can, you can create whatever color map that you, you want. We're, we're, we're going to show you a little bit. And then we we'll also uh, allow people to, you know, save sessions, upload their own custom tracks, build their own data hubs, you know, there's, you know all the things that modern genome browsers uh, do. We're probably the first genome browser that allows people to look at nonlinear genome or chromatin interaction, right? Uh, it's actually really simple because once you know we can break apart the genome, you know, and move things around, we can uh, think about, okay, I can move two interacting parts of the genome next to each other and then compare the epigenetic markup, right? So uh, you can look at chromatin interaction data, high C, chia pad. Back in 2013, we made that, uh, uh, you know, possible already. We also call this sort of a visual bioinformatics engine, right? And we provide some real-time analysis tools. So this is something that many uh, people in the field take advantage of. If you think about, again, you know, what we did there with those very simple innovations, we can take different parts of the genome and rearrange them, or we can put them next to each other. We can also stack them up, right? So for those who run bioinformatics uh, tools, that's nothing but bad intersect, right? Someone, you know, I know many of you probably run bad intersect. Okay, I have my genomic data. I'm gonna intersect with this, intersect with that. We're, we can do this visually, right? So you have your coordinates. You can, you don't have to write any code. You can, you can just click a button and then, and then you can, you know, intersect the different parts of the genome and then put them together the way you want it, right? So, so this is really a visual bioinformatics engine because of these innovations. Uh, you can generate a lot, you know, some, you know, uh, graphs for your research, and you can actually generate really high-resolution PDF screenshots uh, for your publication. Um, but most importantly is we're the developers, and we're actually, you know, continue the development of uh, the Washoe Epigenome Browser. Uh, we focus very much on developing novel and more expressive visual format, right? Same data, there are different ways of looking at the data. You may have very different interpretations. So I, I'm going to give you one example later when we do the, do the uh, hands-on. Um, so 
we focus a lot on you know, creating new ways of looking at your gen genomic data. In fact, we do this in the context of collaboration uh, with investigators. Uh, we're, we, we've designed a comparative epigenome browser so that you can look at you know, different species side by side, you know, right, really right next to each other, compare their uh, epigenetic pattern. Uh, we're developing a cancer genome browser, like I said, you know, you can look at genomic data on the actual coordinate of cancer cells rather than the human uh, reference genome. Um, we actually have a browser for specifically designed for transposable element. Right? So again, that's my, you know, nerdy niche, uh, you know, the, the transposable element, we'll have a, we'll have a browser there. Um, the past year, uh, actually about a year, about a, two years now, Two years ago now, we realized, so, so the browser was developed, started, you know, the browser was started 2010, 2011, right? The field of computing, computer engineering, especially web-based engineering has been evolving very, very fast. So about two years ago, we realized that, you know what, our, we need to fundamentally change our software architecture. So we actually spent a year and a half rewriting every single line of code uh, for this browser. So, um, you know, our old browser is still working and function, uh, but about a few, just a few months ago, we rolled out this new version of browser, the, the new code design uh, for, uh, for reasons, that, you know, for, so this actually allows us to do some, you know, really cool uh, uh, development uh, that's coming up. So, um, I've, I've been running this work, I've run this workshop many times, but today is actually the first time I run this workshop on our new browser, and right? first, first ever. So, so the new browser, you know, actually has, you know, just bear with me, there, there, there's, there's also more bugs than the old, the old ones tested, and the new ones still new, right? So there's still some functions uh, that not working, uh, you know, that well. But, but it's a, the, the design is all modernized, the, the new code is uh, modernized. As I mentioned, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the goals for our, our, for our future development is uh, we're really turning, you know, this browser into a, um, into a v, uh, you know, sort of a VR uh, uh, world in virtual reality. So uh, you can actually walk on the genome, you know, your data is sort of coming up like, you know, buildings and parks on the side, and there's bridges and, you know, high sea loops and things like that. Uh, you, know, we're, you know, this new code is allowing us to do all of those. Uh, and, then, and then we're, you know, re we're, I'm not kidding, we're gonna turn that into a video game. I mean, just imagine, you know, one day, you know, you, you yank out a long non-coding RNA or you blow up a nucleosome, you sprinkle some microRNA in there and then sort of see the, the, the world change around you, right? Don't you want to do like that? Okay. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's what, you know, we, we're continue to develop this. So, so please, you know, give us feedback, right? I'm the developer, right? So, you know, email me, Slack, I'll show, uh, Slack me, I'll, I'll show you how. Um, but we appreciate every single piece of feedback, okay? Uh, oh, so we publish, we continue to publish on our browser, we've published, these are, these are papers just specific on browser functions, right? Um, so if you read any of those, you're my best friend. <laughs> All right, so outreach. Um, so, you know, we developed this tool for ourselves, right? So, you know, I work on Transposon, therefore I want that too. But I really hope this tool is also useful for you, right? So we make sure, um, you know, we have a lot of support. I'll show you. Uh, we're building a community, like us on Facebook. We have Slack channel. I'll show you how to get there. Uh, you know, these are a sample of workshops that I've run uh, before. I mainly run workshops in the context of conference. Um, you know, when that happens, it's usually my students run workshops. They love, love running out workshops because they get to travel with me to like, you know, Puerto Rico or Shanghai, you know, uh, places like that. Mm. We also have um, this booklet. I actually brought 30 copies of this booklet. Um, you know, I think, you know, somehow you're gonna distribute that. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> it's a physical booklet, you know. <laughs> no. Yeah, the booklet is on. I apologize.
apologize. So all this training material is online, so I'll show you. Um, uh, but, uh, but I did bring um, a physical copy um, just for you to have, right? So it's, you know. Okay, so uh, quickly move on. This is the support page. Uh, we're actually gonna visit this page uh, when we do the hands-on. Uh, these are access to the different versions of our tutorial book every year we update. Um, these are a list of uh, workshops. This is actually today's workshop. And for every workshop, we actually create a website uh, with the materials there. So you can actually recreate all this, you know, whatever I show today uh, yourself by following uh, this link. I'll show, uh, again, I'll show, I mean, a bunch of resources there. Um, again, you know, this resolution is kind of uh, um, uh, a little bit disappointing. Uh, but this is the support page. Uh, this is the support page for today's workshop. Right? So a description uh, and uh, con a link to a tutorial book. So resources associated with the workshop include the booklet, both physical and online, um, handout, uh, this is online, I'll show you where they are. They really provide a step-by-step step, step step instruction for the examples I will uh, show in this workshop. And again, you know, at the end of the day, all you need to remember is this website, right? So you're gonna, um, you know, you won't remember what I tell you, but you will go to the website and then spend some time. You know, you probably want, need to spend, you know, a couple of hours to get familiar. And then I guarantee you, once you get hooked up, right? two hours, is, you're gonna get hooked up. You're, you're, you're never gonna leave. I personally spend 50% of my research time just looking at Genome Browser, you know. My, you know, students' data. You know, they. You know, I just, I just play around on on the browser. Okay, just, uh, uh, just, you know, this is sort of a at the end uh, of this part. You know, mm, this is my group, pretty young and dynamic and crazy. I, I, I work in the context of um, several consortiums, funding, and whatnot. Uh, this is Barbara McClintock, uh, who discovered the transposable element. And somehow in our field, we all want to be the reincarnation of her. So uh, but we want to put her on a you know, $20 bill. Okay, we're gonna come back to this, right? This is actually a browser's, uh, this is based on real data. This is going back to the point I made, okay? This is a, this is a browser site. This is real data, right? So the point I wanted to make is big data, right? if you look hard enough, you're gonna find all sorts of patterns uh, you, know, uh, you want to see, right? This is real genomic data, just based on different arrangement, you ended up getting things like this, okay? 